Um, it's all, um, when I walked into the tent, it sort of reminded me how much of, I'm enjoying myself here because this tent has a certain smell, sort of this um, alive, naturey smell. Um, and it's reminded me, of, and some of the other speakers have said the same thing, that this is kind of a special place. So many times you speak in a place that could be anywhere. You go to a conference hall. Um, and I think in this day and age, we're, we sort of get used to placelessness. Uh, to being in an airport or a mall or someplace that's not like any place else. But the great thing about being here is that we walk outside and when the sun goes over the clouds, you get cold. And when the sun comes out, you get warm and it's very sensual. And it's, it's sort of cool to, um, to sort of feel a sense of place. And that's one big reason, um, one big reward of travel and one thing I'm going to be talking about right here. I'm going to start with some of my do um, challenges right at the beginning. My big do and my small do. We'll come back to them later. My, my big do is actually a little bit tied into what I was just talking about. My big do, um, the challenge, is to live lives that are less mediated, to be where you are now. Um, last night I was hanging out with some of the speakers in the green room, and I think there's about six of us. All of us were there ostensibly to check our email, uh, but it didn't work. We couldn't check our email, so it was this little bit of time travel. We're back to this ancient time of like 1989, where if you had <laughs> six people in a room together, you talked to each other. So we ended up having... <laughs> We, we weren't there to talk to each other. We were there to check our email and we were frustrated because we couldn't. But suddenly because um, we couldn't check our email, we had this, we could be where we were. We, we, we were where we are now. Uh, and so that was, that's my big do. Be where you are now. In this day and age, it's really easy to live a mediated life where you're getting all your information and all your experience and even your friends are people that you're chatting with miles and miles away. So that's my big do. Um, my little do, which is very much tied into my book and what I'm going to be talking about, is start to see time as your truest form of wealth. Um, there's a lot of, it, it's easy to get tied up in the idea that money and things are a reflection of how wealthy you are. But if you think about time as your truest form of wealth, then you'll realize that we're all born equally rich in time. And my challenge specifically for the little do is to think about the next year. Think about how you're going to actualize your time wealth. Are you doing something just that's habitual and what you've always been doing? Or are you going to try to do something extraordinary? Are you going to try to free up some time to do something um, that challenges yourself and is different? And um, my talk is about vagabonding, is about uh, travel ostensibly. But keep in mind that these aren't really travel-specific challenges. These are things that can apply to life in general. And I like to think of travel as sort of a metaphor for how you live your life. Life is a journey. And the things that you learn as you travel are very much things that you can apply to yourself. So vagabonding, uh, what is vagabonding? Sim quite, pretty simply, it's long-term travel. It's, it's leaving your normal habitual life to, um, to go out and travel in earnest. Instead of taking a one-week holiday, um, you take a year or six months or six weeks or two years or five years. Um, but it's a way that you're going out sort of as a seeker, not really as a consumer on vacation. You're not taking an escape from your life, but you're sort of going in to what you want your life to become. You're, you're leaving yourself open to new experiences in that way. Um, and I encourage people to think of travels as something they give to themselves. Sometimes you think, oh, I don't have enough money to travel. I'm not young enough to travel. I'm not old enough to travel. Um, but it's not really a demographic thing. Almost anybody can, can utilize simplicity in their lives in such a way that it pays off in free time. Again, going back to the idea of time as wealth. So time is really more important than money in terms of long-term travel. If you want to travel the world for a year, um, huge piles of money is less important than adjusting your life in such a way that you have the time to do something like this. Now, I've been traveling kind of nonstop for the last 15 years. I, I have a home in the United States, but a large portion of each of my years is dedicated to travel, and I've been to some amazing places. Does anybody know where this is? This is Santorini in Greece. I've sailed the Greek islands. Uh, this is the um, the Great Sand Sea in the Libyan desert at the edge of the Sahara in Egypt. Um, I drove a Land Rover across the North and South America about five years ago. This is in Torres del Paine in the south of Chile. Um, about 10 years ago, I bought a Lao fishing boat in, in Laos for about $200 and spent, 300, uh, uh, spent three weeks going 900 miles down the Mekong River, which is the uh, 12th longest river in the world but has the second largest flow of water. Um, and I spent a lot of time in places like Europe. This is the Notre Dame in France. I think there's a sort of an exotic um, and glamorous association with travel. And sometimes people can sort of trick themselves into or trick themselves out of traveling because they think that they don't have the, the necessary experience or glamour. So I always show people this picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> when I was 18, 
And if anybody was not destined to go down the Mekong or drive across the Americas or sail through the Greek islands, it was this dorky guy in the Cosby sweater from 20 years ago. Um, and so if this guy can travel the world for years and years, um, anybody can put their plans into action. I, I think I was about 17 when this picture was taken, and that was an age um, when you start to think about what you're going to do in the next phase of your life. Um, and I grew up right in the middle of the United States, uh, a, a pretty isolated and provincial part of the United States, and there weren't a lot of people telling me that travel is an important thing, that travel is even something that I could do. But it was about this time in my life when my grandfather, who um, had worked his whole life as a farmer, was getting ready to retire. If anybody had earned his retirement, it was him. And society teaches you, oh, you know, retirement is when you can have fun. You work your whole life and you have fun when you're retired. Well, my grandmother got Alzheimer's about the time that my grandfather was retiring, and he didn't really get to enjoy his retirement. He basically spent it taking care of her. And so I learned it in, a sort of, in a very sad way when I was very young that life doesn't just reward you with free time after a, a lifetime of hard work. You have to create your own time. You have to be dynamic and create opportunities for yourself. So after college, I worked as a landscaper for a year. I outfitted a, a van, uh, and I traveled the United States. I, was, I thought, well, I'm not going to do this when I retire, I'll do it when I'm 23, my travel itch will be scratched, and then I can work my whole life and, and, um, and do my American duty of being a workaholic. <laughs> Unfortunately, or fortunately, um, I had an amazing eight months traveling the United States, living in a van, but I didn't scratch my travel itch. I was out of money, so I moved to Korea uh, to teach English for a couple of years, and I saved my money, and I sort of realized from that first trip that it was the simplicity that had allowed me to travel, and that when I, was, when I traveled, the more I traveled, the more I learned about how to travel, the more I learned about how to get more good experiences out of my travel and to sa how to save money. Uh, so these are my students. These guys are probably in college now, but I worked in Korea for two years. Not only did it save, save up a lot of money for me to travel Asia for a couple of years, but it, learned me to ex it, it taught me to uh, ex experience culture at a gut level. You can intellectualize a culture, but until you're in a place like Korea that maybe doesn't value individualism, which is something Americans value because individualism is seen as betrayal of f uh, family and duty, you learn that gut level understanding of other cultures, which is an important part of what we learn when we travel. Um, when I was in Korea, I did some travels inside the country. This is, uh, th this is actually North Korea. They have a, a conference room that straddles the DMZ uh, and the diplomats go in and argue about trying to end this conflict that's been going on for 50 years. But part of the tour is that a South Korean guard, the one here, they'll take you, uh, they say, okay, now we're going to go to North Korea. And then they walk across the room and you get your picture <laughs> taken. And you've been to North Korea. So after two years, in, two years of working in Korea, I um, embarked on a journey around Asia that I would hope would last a year. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a, a sadhu at the Kumbh Mela Festival in India a gathering of, uh, of people every 12 years on the Ganges. And in 2001, it was the 12th, 12th year. It was the largest gathering of humans uh, in the history of the planet. The, about 80 million people went through this area over the course of six weeks. Uh, and this is about, this, it looks empty here, but that's because there's only about 10 million people at, at the festival. And if you turn around, there's six miles of people back to the center of the Kumbh Mela Festival. Um, but what I learned when I traveled around Asia is that travel has its own dynamic and you, can, you can't really predict what's going to happen to you when you're sitting at home. Uh, and so I encourage people to let the trip take you. You can plan it, you can over plan it, you can think, you can have all these expectations, but at the end of the day, the trip itself will have its own dynamic. And if you're not open to that, own, to that dynamic of what's going to happen, then you might be selling your trip short. For example, I went into Asia, and this is a very stereotypical Asian shot of these are uh, Buddhist monks in, in Myanmar. But for every moment I had like this, for every moment that I saw something that I expected to see, I saw something like this. This is in Thailand. This is not in Kansas, where I'm from. This is not cowboy country. Um, it's a cowboy ranch. It's called Pensuk, and um, it's not for American people. It's not for Westerners. It's actually an expression of Thai culture. We go to Thailand, and we go to the beaches, and we see the temples, and we cl climb mountains in the jungle. Well, the Thai people have seen that. So a lot of middle class people from Bangkok, when they want to have a holiday, <laughs> They go in to Pensuk Cowboy Ranch and they ride horses and shoot bows and arrows and, and uh, shoot guns. And so the world has mixed up so much these days that what catches you unexpectedly can sometimes be as revealing about a place like Thailand as what you expected to see when you were there. Another thing that I quickly learned that helps you enhance your travels is, is to slow down. 
slow down and let experiences happen. You've heard of the slow movement, the slow food movement. I'm a believer in the slow travel movement. That uh, if you just take your time and let experiences happen and don't force experiences on your travels, then interesting things will happen. Um, one obvious uh, way to, uh, to be slow is to walk. I walked across Israel about eight years ago. Um, and you experience a place differently at a walking pace than you would um, in a bus or in a car. And I'm not saying you have to walk everywhere, and I certainly don't walk everywhere myself. But just keep in mind that part of the advantage of taking a year off to travel, um, as opposed to taking two weeks off to travel, is you can take it at a special pace. You, can, you, can, you don't have to micromanage your life like you do at home. You can just let things happen. And sometimes it's the mistakes that you make or the unexpected things um, that make the, the travel worth the, uh, the effort to go out there. Another thing I encourage, sort of in the same, the same idea, is, is quality over quantity of experiences. Um, oftentimes people will send me emails and they'll say, oh, I want to go to Spain and I want to see these five cities. And I, I say, well, how much time do you have? And they say, a week. And it's like, okay, well, how much, I mean, if you, if you try to see five Spanish cities in a week, then odds are you're going to see mostly the insides of a bus and you're going to be exhausted. Just find one Spanish city and get to know it well. Um, this, is, uh, this is Cusco in Peru, which is actually a place um, that's very much on the tourist trail, but I was really entranced by, uh, by Cusco. And, and when I was there, I was there for a few days, and I realized that I, if I left the city after two days, I would be selling myself short. So I ended up staying there for two weeks and had a much more in-depth experience of that place because I stayed there longer. And I encourage, as a corollary of that, I encourage people to, um, to, to do an expatriate experience, to actually move overseas and live there for a while. Um, to just sort of let, um, to sort of have that experience. You, you will experience a place differently after two years than you would after two weeks. And of course you can't spend two years everywhere in the world. But just keep in mind that how much time you spend in a place is going to, be, is going to affect your experience there. And then um, the journey is more important than the destination. Um, when we think about travel, for example, we think about a place like this. Does anybody know what this is? This is Machu Picchu in Peru. These are the sort of things that inspire us to travel. These are the things that we dream about before we have traveled. But sometimes you go to a place that's <laughs> wonderful and that you've dreamt about, take Versailles, and what do you see? You see Versailles, but you see 10,000 people who are exactly like you, um, other tourists. The iconic parts of, of, the, of the tourist trail in the world tend to be occupied by people who are just like us. Uh, and I can make fun of these people for holding their cameras up, but how do you think I got this picture? by holding my camera up. So keep in mind that sometimes the, the perfect place you have in your mind is in actuality full of people like you. And the most memorable things that happen are what happens on the way to your dream places. And a part of this principle is the idea of getting off the beaten path. And this is a, this is a word that's used a lot. Um, and it's easier to get off the beaten path than you might think. Uh, if you go to the Champs-Élysées in Paris, um, there's a lot of chain stores there, there's a lot of tourists there. But maybe if you go one arrondissement over, if you walk for 10 minutes in any direction, you'll find a place that's more authentically Parisian. A lot of people go to India and they go to Goa. There's a lot of fun to be had in Goa. Uh, when I was there, I went, when I was in India, I went to Diu, which is an old Portuguese possession, an island off the coast of Gujarat. It has a lot of the same attractions that Goa has, nice beaches, old historical aspects, but just fewer people. And so uh, keep in mind that there's places you've always dreamed about that you'll love to go, but don't be afraid to get off the beaten path and find places that are a little bit counterintuitive. And what I consider most important of all is to seek people as you travel. Um, you, you dream of a place like Machu Picchu or the Giza Pyramids, but what really makes you remember these places are the people that you meet there. Um, and if you can keep your travels center, um, people centered, then it just enriches things and it allows you to learn in a way that, that that is not possible if you're just looking at sites. These are a couple of girls I, I met in Laos on a, an expedition to a very isolated part of that country. Um, one great way that I found to meet people is to travel alone. Um, and I'm not saying that everybody has to travel alone all the time, but traveling alone allows you to be open to other people in a way that traveling with even one other person doesn't. Um, it, Sometimes if you're traveling with an old friend, you can fall back on a conversation of what happened in high school or what happened on a television show. If you're traveling alone, you, you have to confront your loneliness by being a little bit more extroverted. Uh, and so this is, I, because I travel alone so much, I have a thousand pictures of me like this that I took of myself. Uh, th this is Bagan in, in, in Myanmar, in Burma. Uh, and uh, it's these great 
monuments that are spread out over this valley. And um, Marco Polo actually mentions this place in his writings. But I was there by myself, so I took a picture of myself. Another thing to keep in mind is that we travel for adventure, but I like to encourage a different way of thinking what adventure is. Um, often we think of adventure as a purely physical act, where you're going out in the world and you're climbing a mountain, or you're going down a river, or you're jumping off of a bridge with a bungee cord strapped to your ankles. But I like to think of any kind of adventure as uh, challenging your comfort zone. And sometimes that can just mean um, going to the bus station and not really knowing where you're going to go. Find a, find a destination and then just go there and see what happens. This is, uh, this is actually high class travel in Sudan. I was in Sudan last summer uh, traveling with a friend of mine. And um, this is probably the most comfortable mode of travel in, in South Sudan. And sometimes it can be an adventure, just as much of an adventure, to take a 12 hour bus ride at the base of the mountain than to climb the mountain. And in the course of that 12-hour bus ride, you really get to know those people that you're jammed up against. So I like to encourage a flexible idea of adventure. I think another thing that can enhance your adventure as a traveler is to volunteer, and especially volunteer your talents. Uh, when I was in Myanmar, as a former teacher, um, I often seek out around the world uh, English teachers who might enjoy having a native speaker of English come and talk to the students. And so in Myanmar, I, um, I volunteered my time and talked to these students. Um, and the students themselves were very excited to have a, a native speaker of English in this town called Pokoku. And they invited me to see aspects of their own world. They, they invited me to um, what's called a pue in Myanmar, which is, a, which is an all-night festival with singing and dancing and uh, food and puppet shows. And in the case of uh, Myanmar, transvestite cabaret. <laughs> Now this is not something that I, found, that I would have found in my guidebook. This is an experience that was completely unexpected because I had volunteered as a teacher. And it's a little town of like 15,000 people. And in the UK or the US, a town of 15,000 people probably doesn't have a transvestite cabaret during their, during their county fair. But, um, <laughs> um, but in this audience full of monks and families, my, my student, I turned to my students and I said, is this what I think it is? And they said, yeah, it's, it's gay play. <laughs> and, and so they, they ha in that part of the world, there's, they just have a, a very tolerant attitude of, of sexual identities. And that's something I never would have learned if I had just come in as a, as a surface level traveler. It took that uh, teaching experience for me to be invited into that corner. And I think almost any skill that you have, from IT to, to truck driving to almost anything, can give you a window into a place as you're traveling. And the unexpected things like this are some, sometimes some of my favorite things to find as I travel. Um, and so I was walking through Sweden, and this was a double take. I'm actually from Kansas. Um, and, and it's the same color as the Kentucky Fried Chicken sign, but then I took a double take, and, and um, Kansas Fried Chicken, I don't know why um, the proprietor decided to have a Kansas Fried Chicken, if he had a bad experience with Kentucky Fried Chicken, or he was just trying to do. But this, this is in Sweden, I mean, where they speak better English than we do. Um, for some reason, they had Kansas Fried Chicken. But uh, speaking of 11 herbs and spices, uh, does anybody know what this is? Uh, it's not a rat, it's close, it's a guinea pig, it, or a qui as they, as they say in South America. And, and um, we see a guinea pig as a pet, but in the Andes, they've seen it as a source of protein for hundreds of generations. Um, and food can be an interesting window into a culture. When I was living in, in Korea, some of my middle-aged businessmen students would talk about eating dog during the su hot summer months. And I thought, dog, wow. That's, that sounds kind of strange. So I asked them, we love our dogs in America. Why are you eating dogs? This seems so inhumane. And they said, well, we'll tell you two things. One, I mean, you have goldfish, but that doesn't stop you from eating tuna, right? You know, we have pet dogs and we have uh, food dogs. And two, you, you Americans are always coming in and talking about being humane um, with your pets. And you, you buy sweaters for your pets and you give them their own room in the house. And you, you love them better when you, than your family. But here in Korea, we may eat dogs sometimes. But when our old people get old, we take care of them. Where you're from, you, you outsource them. You send them across town <laughs> to, a, to a nursing home. And then you visit them once a month. And oh, you're such a great grandson. you know. Whereas we actually make sacrifices. And, and you might think it's strange that we, me, we eat dogs, but we think it's a little strange that you treat your old people like um, something that needs to be outsourced to, to another location. So it was sort of humbling to me. I, I came in with a very righteous attitude and through food learned a lesson about culture that was sort of humbling from my point of view. Another thing that I encourage uh, among travelers is uh, to learn something. Um, I, I come from the American Midwest. We stand far apart. We're not very good at dancing. So I thought the most challenging thing I could do is go to Latin America and learn how to dance. 
So this is me learning merengue in, um, in the Dominican Republic. I got pretty good at, at, at merengue. I also went to Cuba to learn the salsa, and the unexpected happened. I ended up learning the bagpipes instead. <laughs> <laughs> now, you might think, wow, he went to Cuba and he learned an instrument that's not even Cuban. But when you think about salsa, it's sort of a mixture of the different cultures that came into Cuba, that came into the Caribbean, and produced this musical form. Well, a lot of people came from Celtic regions of Spain um, to Cuba as well. So the Asturian Federation, which is where I learned how to play the bagpipes, um, people with Asturian heritage or people who are interested in the Celtic parts of Spain, who are mostly like 25-year-old hipsters in Cuba, um, they play the bagpipes. And so instead of being good at salsa, I'm now okay at bagpipes. <laughs> and the, n the nice flip side of, of the lesson I learned there is that I got to see my Cuban friends as travelers. Cubans live in sort of a repressive society and they don't get to travel much. So they went to a Celtic mu music festival in Nova Scotia last year and I got to see them as tourists. And one of their favorite, a place that they were most fascinated by was Walmart. In Cuba, um, well actually in, in the United States we sort of looked, looked down our nose at Walmart, it's sort of where poor people go to shop and it's a, this horrible manifestation of mass culture, but Cubans didn't really see it as a place to shop. They just saw, they came from a place that doesn't have many consumer goods and, and a whole wall of shoes is not something that they'd have ever seen in their lives. So it was like looking at a waterfall or something to them. And so seeing Canada through Cuban eyes gave me a perspective on Canada that, that I wasn't used to. Um, and I, I think there's always a complicated, um, interrelated part of travel um, that makes you think about how the interaction of peoples works. Uh, this is uh, a Mercy girl from southwestern Ethiopia. Um, it's a very tribal part of the world that wasn't really opened up to outsiders until about 20 years ago and hasn't seen that many tourists until about 10 years ago. Now, she's probably about 13 or 14 years old, uh, but in a few years she will begin a process that will end up with her looking like this. Her lower lip will be severed, her lip will be stretched out with, first with wooden and later with clay plates as a beautification ritual. And um, the question is, why do they do this? Why do they mutilate their women in uh, southwestern Ethiopia? Nobody's really sure. Some people think it might have been something to deter slave traders generations ago uh, to mutilate their women. But it's a little bit disturbing. This can be seen as a, a pure manifestation of, of cultural heritage, but is it a good thing? Is the presence of outsider, will the presence of outsiders maybe make them stop uh, mutilating their women so that they look like this? Um, is it good that you maintain a cultural tradition like this? The answer is not always easy. And as complicated as that issue is, behind these photos is the fact that everywhere I went when I traveled in southwestern Ethiopia, there was a negotiation to take pictures of tribespeople. And so there's actually a photograph economy um, going on in southwestern Ethiopia. And this is just an exaggerated version of what can happen everywhere in the world. It's called staged authenticity, where when I go to southwestern Ethiopia, I don't want a picture of a Mercy tribesman wearing Nikes and, and blue jeans and t-shirt. We want to see them looking as extreme and traditional as possible. And so there's this sort of market of traditionalness that creates a staged authenticity. So that when we come to these villages, they might be wearing their t-shirt because it's more comfortable, but when they see the bus coming, they'll put on their goat skins and put on their war paint because they know they can make, they can make more money that way. Uh, and, and so it's a strange, um, it, it's a difficult um, meeting of two different cultures. It's not always easy when, when a host uh, and, and a guest dynamic comes together, including, uh, uh, for example, in Australia, um, Actually, you can't see this. The slide isn't zoomed in. Does anybody know what, what this is? This is Ayers Rock or Uluru. There's a sign that's cut off in this particular version of the slide that says, don't climb Uluru. Please don't climb. We're the Pichinjara local Aboriginal people. We, we think this rock is sacred. We don't climb up the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, so please don't climb this. But then right behind that sign, you see this long line of hikers going up using a chain that's maintained by the Australian Park Service for that purpose. So obviously there are some, there's, there's a complicated dynamic going on where some Australians don't think it's a problem. Some indigenous Australians very much th think that it's, it's not moral to climb this rock. And as a traveler, as a tourist, you come up against these, uh, these questions, sort of the ethical, it's sort of the ethical realm inside which you travel. And so all these lessons that you learn as a traveler um, 
you come back and they can inform your home life. And I, I like to think that, again, um, actually this is my home back in Kansas uh, on, on the theme of simplicity. Uh, I've been a professional journalist for 10 years now, but instead of living in a fashionable district of New York or San Francisco, I live in a, uh, in a little converted double wide house on the prairies in Kansas. It's very inexpensive and it sort of enables, it's part of the simplicity that enables me to travel as much as I do. Um, but what you learn on the road um, is that um, so many travel metaphors um, apply at home. And a lot of the lessons that you learn as a traveler are things that you can come back and apply at home. T.S. Eliot has that, that, that line, which I can paraphrase as, after the journey you go home and you see your home for the first time. You see it for the first time. And so uh, a lot of people have been around the world but haven't seen what's in their backyard. So I encourage people to take that attitude of travel and openness and curiosity um, to their own home and, and sort of come home an, an improved person and, and, and take the, the attitude of what they learned um, to their home. Um, and I encourage you to do that. And I know I've been talking a lot about my own travels, but when we get to the Q&A, um, I'm interested in hearing about what has been on your mind about your travels and things that might have um, uh, stumbling blocks that you've come across or great ideas that you have. But uh, thanks for your time.